If you will, open your Bibles uh, to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, uh, the first of the prophetic books in our Old Testament, uh, the book of Isaiah. Chapter 45, we're going to read uh, as we begin this morning, verses 5 through 7. Uh, I will go ahead and say a word that uh, things do look a little different up here uh, today. And I am uh, appreciative uh, to all of those that uh, had a part in making the, the background happen uh, for this week and all of the decorations and, of course, all of those that are going to be involved in our Vacation Bible School this week. I am amazed uh, year after year as I speak uh, to adults to find out how many of them would say that they were converted through the ministry of Vacation Bible School. And uh, so we pour a lot into it. Uh, it is a week. Uh, when, we, when we come in here next week, there'll be a lot of tired people uh, in our building because it is a demanding week. Uh, the people uh, involved with setting our building up have been working for several weeks, maybe even months. And I'm, I'm amazed that it hasn't been too long ago that so much of this was cardboard boxes and sheets of styrofoam. And uh, something that I would have absolutely uh, zero ability to uh, pull off. Uh, I do notice there's an outstanding uh, young man pictured there. Uh, now, I, does that mean that you would like to send me to the bottom of the sea or something? Is, is that... I'm not sure exactly how to interpret that sign, uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, that, that's, that's okay. But again, we're looking forward to a tremendous week uh, this week. And I do think it's, I'm not a gimmicky pastor and, 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 you know, don't try to come up with tricks and cute things. But I do think it's kind of fun uh, for this Sunday to be uh, in front of something as uh, unique and well done as uh, this is. Well, all right, Isaiah uh, chapter 45, we're going to continue uh, our journey uh, through uh, Route 66, and we have come uh, to the books of prophecy or the prophetic books of our uh, Old Testament. The Old Testament books of prophecy are dramatic, and they are powerful. And they are often difficult to understand. The Old Testament prophet called for repentance, warned of sure judgment, and reminded the nation of God's faithfulness. They were men of courageous faith who lived in dangerous times. They spoke to both the powerful and the powerless. Their clarity and consistency were models for the character and the proclamation of the New Testament apostles and should remain models and examples for bold preaching of biblical truth. You will often hear me say that we need to preach prophetically. That doesn't mean we need to be predicting the future. What I'm speaking to is a type of preaching that is confrontational and ever relevant with its indictment of sin and call to repentance. Each of the prophets anticipates Christ in his words and in his deeds as Jesus is the ultimate and perfect prophet and the fulfillment of the promise of a prophet like unto Moses. So let's think about the great truth that we read in this book of Isaiah of our Lord and as our God, our sovereign creator, our sovereign savior, as he says to us, as he has said from all of eternity past and will say into eternity future, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Verse 5. 
I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Pray with me. Father, again, we thank you for your word. It is a word given so many centuries ago, and it remains ever relevant because it is indeed ever true. I pray that we would be able to rightly divide so that we may rightly understand and it may be rightly applied for the good of our souls and for the glory of the one who has created us and the one who has saved us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles back to chapter 1, and we'll be going back and forth a lot. Uh, it was mentioned to me this morning when I was asked which book would we be in today. Uh, the, when I said Isaiah, it was noted that indeed that is a very long book. And I think they were fearful that we could have a... Why are you laughing? There is no laughing even on VBS Sunday at North Play. But indeed, there is a lot here. And I've, I've enjoyed this sermon series, but indeed, it, it is frustrating because there's so much here that you would like to be able uh, to bring out. It, it is worth noting that about 40% of the Old Testament is made up of these major and minor prophets, uh, uh, 17 of, of 39 books. That, that is a lot. And so we should give it due attention, and, and, it, and I am hopeful that our survey through the historical books of the Old Testament will help you uh, to contextualize the, the, the original uh, context of uh, the ministry of these prophets, as well as remember that these uh, prophets proclaimed their truth in light of God's covenant with this Old Covenant people, the, the Old Testament uh, people of God, uh, the nation of Israel. And so all of those things are important to us as we seek to rightly divide uh, for the sake of, of understanding. And so, as I've said, these books are, are dramatic. They, they, they get your attention. They're difficult. They are uh, confusing. They're graphic. They are at times coarse, even uh, crude, not, not polite language, not for the sake of drawing attention to the author or the speaker, but for the sake of clarity. Some of the language particularly uh, pertains uh, to the offense directed toward God by the rebellion of his people. And it is typically described by many of the prophets in language that we might not use in polite company and probably shouldn't use in polite company in a sense. But yet, God wants us to understand the great horror of turning your back upon the Holy One, the One who has created and the One who has saved. And so let's begin and talk just a, a, a minute about these Old Testament prophets. And, and I, if you'll remember several weeks ago, I, I mentioned that one of the problems in reading through your Bible is you move backwards and forwards in time. That we have gone from Ecclesiastes uh, and the, the Song of Solomon, uh, which were written 
roughly 930 B.C. And all of a sudden, as we come to chapter 1 of the book of Isaiah, we have moved forward 200 years. And as we work our way through these 17 books, they're not in chronological order. And so we're going to be going back and forth. And even within the books themselves, sometimes the writer is not telling his story in terms of a historical chronology. And so it makes it uh, fairly difficult uh, for us to, to understand. Now, because I am such a benevolent guy, Amen. Thank you. I, I needed that. Uh, you have two handouts in, in your Bibles. And I don't wanna, if you want to open them up, they're, they're printed landscape, horizontal. Uh, just real quickly, just to, to help you a bit. Uh, the first one says, Timeline of the Old Testament with the kings of Israel and Judah and the writing prophets. So uh, we've talked a little bit about the division of Judah and Israel, northern and southern kingdoms, at the death of Solomon, uh, when under Rehoboam and Jeroboam, uh, the kingdom splits. And so about 200 years after that, uh, you have Isaiah appearing on the scene. And so uh, there, I list, first of all, the prophets of the divided kingdom. Uh, the J and the I indicate their primary ministry was either directed toward Judah, southern kingdom, or Israel, uh, the northern kingdom, and you can see there the kings and the time frames. And so you have the prophets of the divided kingdom followed by the exilic prophets. Those are the prophets that their ministries were uh, closely uh, associated uh, with the fall of Jerusalem at the hands of Babylon. Uh, then you have uh, the post-exilic prophets, those that uh, prophesied after the return to uh, the land of Judah after the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And so you have roughly, uh, I guess, what, three major divisions of time uh, there. And then I also throw in some of the more noted uh, prophets that did not leave for us uh, a book that's included in our Bible and along with time frames. On the second uh, handout, I just give you a Bible timeline. And I've always found these things uh, fairly helpful just to kind of get my mind around the, the kind of the when. And if you look at the left-hand column, of course, I began at creation, but if you go down just below the halfway or mark, uh, you'll see the, the reign of Solomon followed by the divided kingdom. And then you get about 400 years of kind of the golden age of prophecy in the Old Testament. And so you see uh, the northern prophets or the prophets to the northern kingdom and then the prophets to the southern kingdom and then a rough timeline uh, all the way up to the destruction of the temple uh, in, in Jerusalem. So you may find those helpful. I, I hope you will. And you can hang on to them and, and use them uh, as we go through these uh, next uh, 17 uh, weeks. So, uh, we're looking at this book of Isaiah, and he is probably writing uh, somewhere around 700 uh, B.C. Um, and so, uh, he occurs kind of in the early third of the work of these, uh, of these prophets. And the purpose of the Old Testament prophet was to assess the condition of the nation to warn her of her failings and proclaim the truth of God's faithfulness. They were to warn of judgment and call for repentance and a, a return to covenantal faithfulness. Uh, if you go back to Deuteronomy, you'll find a section that's, that's usually in, a, in your study Bibles may say something like blessings and cursings. And we've pointed to those out over the years. But God spelled out very precisely, if you obey me, you will prosper in the land. If you disobey me, I will destroy you. And so the prophets, with that in view, are saying, return to the Lord. He will be faithful, and he will be faithful to bless you should you repent, and he will be faithful to do what? To destroy you if you persist 
in your rebellion. So the prophet spoke to the political leadership, the religious leadership, and the citizens of both kingdoms. Now, let's, let's talk about some guidelines, and, and probably most of these really apply to just reading uh, your Bible. You need to consider the initial audience and the intent of the author or the authorial intent. Uh, I think it's worth noting, did they write uh, before the exile, during the exile, after the exile? Uh, that helps us discern uh, what they mean by uh, what they are saying. And so we, we need to understand what was being said and what was being said to whom really before we can start talking about this is how it applies in our modern context. The Word of God from Genesis to Revelation is always applicable and it is always relevant. But you've got to rightly divide it. You can't just jerk a passage out of your Bible and say, well, this is my verse and I'm applying it this way when it may not have any relevance to what you're trying uh, to claim. And so, for example, in Deuteronomy 25.4, there's a verse there that is quoted twice in our New Testament. You shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain. So, everybody here is off the hook, right? Does anybody here own an ox? Now, I may have missed this. I don't know everything about everybody, uh, but I'm going to guess we don't have any ox owners. Am I? Okay. Right. Oh, uh, Kristen's got one. Okay. All right. A, 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 new, a new addition to the menagerie. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that has no relevance, right? You, in fact, you can cut it out of your Bible, right? Don't nod your head. Wrong. Paul says it's relevant in terms of basically how you treat your pastor. That's kind of the context he quotes it in. But really, the, the original context is not only a word about how to treat God's creatures, and it is. It, it is a word about how to treat God's creatures. But it's also a word about how to treat the owner of that creature, how to love your neighbor. Now, I know uh, that... Uh, Heath, particularly, loves my Somerville quotations. This is not a Somerville quotation. This is a Theodore, Alabama quotation. There you go. Yeah, now we're on to something. But sometimes when, when Joy Brittner and I compare notes about working for our dads growing up, his line was, he worked me like a rented mule. Or a Hebrew slave. Or a Hebrew slave. Okay. All right. Either one. But the idea is, if it's somebody's mule, you don't care how you treat it. You get the work out of it, and you just take it back, which is what? Dishonoring to the animal and its owner, okay? And, and so this kind of thing comes forward. But it's the idea, and Keith Mullins just walked in. There's another good example there. If you, if you loan somebody your four-wheeler, yeah, and you say, bring it back because I'm going deer hunting Friday. Don't make me have to come hunting it up. And you have to drive to the boonies of St. Clair County, Alabama to get your own four-wheeler. You have violated, don't muzzle the ox. That was good. But again... About, it comes down to love your neighbor, respect God's creation. So that comes forward, does it not? Even if you don't own them, if, even if Kristen is the only one here that owns, owns an ox. All right. So we have to understand those things. And there's so many. We've talked in, in the, when we went through the, the books of wisdom, all of the various literary devices. And I, gosh, it seems like the prophetic books even have more uh, literary uh, devices, but you, you get the apocalyptic language, this foreboding imagery that the prophets appeal to. In, in Isaiah 24, 19, 
He wrote, the earth is utterly broken. Does that mean if you were standing on the moon and you look back and the earth would be broken in half or broken into little pieces? It is split apart. The earth is violently shaken. The earth staggers like a drunk man. That means that either on its axis or its orbit around the sun, it's kind of wobbling all over the place. That is figurative, symbolic language that speaks of cataclysmic upheaval in the world. Okay? And, and so that, that gives us pause. Uh, you know, several years ago, and, and I really didn't follow this up very much, but evidently, there was a phenomenon, a legitimate uh, astronomical uh, phenomenon of, of what they call a blood moon, okay? And so, you know, I got all kinds of emails and everything about the blood moon, the blood moon, and this is going to happen and that's going to happen and so forth and, and so on. And, you know, maybe so, I'm, I'm not poo-pooing it all. I'm not saying it's all wrong. But be careful because Peter himself appealed to the apocalyptic language at the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost where he says the sun is turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Well, and he was saying that, that what Joel was talking about years before, centuries before, with the coming of the Spirit, that day is this day. And I doubt very seriously that the moon turned to blood. That is, again, apocalyptic language that describes dramatic events both in heaven and on earth, okay? They're not necessarily to be taken literally. There's all kinds of symbols. When we get to the book of Daniel, Daniel's statue, golden head, feet of clay, Daniel's uh, beast. Uh, in Isaiah, uh, we see uh, uh, metaphors uh, such as the arm of the Lord. The Lord is a spirit. He doesn't have physical uh, parts. We talk about trampling uh, under his feet. There's all kind of visions and even the, the speaker being transported to, to foreign places, even heaven itself. And so as we study these things, don't confuse. Don't confuse Old Testament Israel with the United States of America. Okay? They're, they're two different entities. Okay? Don't confuse Old Testament Israel and the church. Now, I a lot of times will describe the church as the fulfilling, the I-N-G, fulfilling of God's promises in the Old Testament. That we await what I believe is the fulfillment of all that God has promised, but we're in the midst of the fulfilling, and there are things that uh, are uh, in continuity with Old Testament Israel, and there are things that are in discontinuity with Old Testament Israel. And it's important to know uh, the difference. Don't confuse the modern state of Israel with the Old, to Old Testament, the Old Covenant people of God. There, there's, there's a difference. And again, I say that politically. I'm very pro-Israel, but, but, but they're not the, uh, the Old Covenant people of God dwelling in the land. It's interesting and it's unique and there's something to it, but I don't know exactly what. We'll, we'll find out one day, won't we? If we live long enough, if we don't, we'll look back on it on e in eternity. So don't confuse that. Don't confuse the New Testament's Christian and the Old Testament saint. They're, they're, they're living in different contexts. They're living under different covenants. Don't confuse the Old, Test Old Covenant theocracy uh, with the New Testament church. And there's a lot we could uh, say uh, there. The nature... Understand the nature of prediction and fulfillment. There are partial fulfillments, initial fulfillments, complete fulfillments, all of this type thing. Uh, we'll see uh, here in just a few moments. When Isaiah predicts that the virgin uh, shall conceive and bear a child. Well, guess what? That happened in Isaiah's day. But yet what else? Under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, the Gospel writer Matthew quotes that passage and applies it to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's kind of a, a partial initial fulfillment uh, in the history of Israel, and there's a complete and perfect and ultimate fulfillment in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's kind of near fulfillments and far fulfillments and all of this. And, and many times there's kind of what, what some call a telescoping of events that uh, uh, events seem like they're going to occur almost simultaneously or one right after the other, 
when in fact there are many years separating uh, various uh, fulfillments. I'm, I am certainly on board with what Wayne Grudem says uh, about uh, prophecy. And he says something along this line. It, it doesn't seem likely that all the prophecies of the Bible have been fulfilled. I would say that I think there are things that we're awaiting uh, the fulfillment of. But it's possible. And if listen, if Jesus comes back, I'm not going to be, whoa, 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 whoa. You haven't done this, that, and the other. You need to wait a minute. You're making a mistake. You're too early. And if he explains to me and says, well, this was the fulfillment of that, what am I going to say? Amen. Amen. So be aware that there's nothing to stop Jesus from coming back before we walk out of this building today. And so we need to operate in that fashion. There are places as we go through these books that I will have to speak with a certain amount of humility that here's some possibilities or here's some things. I'm not exactly sure. To understand it this way gives me pause and to understand it that way will give me pause. But as I've told you before, you can't step into the pulpit every Sunday and do your best Joel Osteen imitation. I don't know. I guess maybe. You can't do that. Okay? You got, you got to step up. You got to swing for the fences, so to speak. I wish the Braves would swing for a few more these days. Anyway. All right. Introduction to Isaiah uh, himself. We've talked about the date. He tells us that in the year Uzziah dies, that he is called to this prophetic uh, office, it extends possibly all the way to the reign of wicked Manasseh around 686 B.C. So you're looking at 50 or 60 years of public uh, ministry. There are those that believe when the writer of Hebrews is writing chapter 11 and expounding upon what sometimes we call the roll call of faith, or the hall of fame of faith, when he speaks of those that were sown in two, that it is a reference to the martyrdom of this prophet Isaiah at the hands of the wicked king uh, Manasseh. So Isaiah's name means Yahweh is salvation, and indeed he has a great deal to speak of in terms of the salvation of God. He is referred to as the son of Amoz, and it seems that he came from a prominent family, if not a royal family. His ministry is fine, primarily focused, again, on the southern kingdom in contrast to the northern kingdom. So, kind of the, the context historically, it, the internal, he's addressing the internal corruption and the external enemies of the divided kingdom. An assortment of historical and neighboring enemies would in various ways, degrees, and time frames place uh, assorted, repeated cycles of pressures upon the nation. If you want to make yourself a note, it's very interesting to go back and read 2 Kings 15 through 21, 2 Chronicles 26 through 33, and even in the book of Isaiah, there's a whole section of the history of the day in chapters 36 through 39. Isaiah is called to the prophetic ministry in the final year of a long 53 years, successful and for the most part godly reign of King Uzziah, who's also known as Azariah in 2 Kings 15. Uzziah ruled Judah during a time when both Egypt and the soon-to-be ascendant military power of Assyria were not threatening them uh, as much. Upon Uzziah's death, his son Jotham ascended to the throne, and peace and prosperity continued. Upon Jotham's, Jotham's death, his son Ahaz ascended to the throne, and during his reign, an aggressive Assyria conquered the northern kingdom, known as Israel, and their armies advanced to within eight miles of Jerusalem. At that time, Ahaz made the ill-fated decision to negotiate with Assyria, and through that, Judah became subservient to Assyria. Ahaz's son, Hezekiah, 
followed his, son, his, his father to the throne. He was a godly and successful king because he was godly. He rebelled against Assyria. And the city and the nation were threatened by 200,000 Assyrian uh, troops. Isaiah promised deliverance from this overwhelming force. Hezekiah trusted God. And we're told in 2 Kings 19.35 that the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrian troops. A devastating rout of that army. The remaining army fled back to Nineveh where their king, Sennacherib, was murdered by his own sons in the temple of Nisroch. Thus Judah was spared by God through his judgment upon Assyria. We'll talk a bit over the next few weeks about God's salvation coming through his judgment. Tragically, Hezekiah was succeeded uh, by his wicked son Manasseh, and as I've mentioned, uh, some believe that Isaiah lived to that point and was martyred there. Uh, he would be followed by the godly king, Josiah, and even with all of the reforms that he put in place, he could not deliver the kingdom from the judgment that was sure to come to them because of their unfaithfulness. If you want to make the book fairly simple, this doesn't work perfectly, but it'll work a little bit. You can divide it into three sections. That is, uh, the first being God's warnings to his people, beginning in chapter 1 and going through uh, chapter 11, verse 16. And then God's warfare against his enemies, beginning in chapter 12 and going through chapter 39, verse 8. And then this final section that begins in chapter 40 and runs to the end of the book, God's work to save his people. So there's three words for you, warnings, warfare, and work, if you want to divide the book up uh, in that particular fashion. Now, let's look at the book and try to, to survey it uh, better, more in a more detailed uh, way. And Isaiah, at least in my reading, of all the prophets, is the most God-centered. In other words, much of what he says, yes, he indicts the people. Yes, he speaks of their wickedness. But he says an incredible amount about the character of God, uh, the attributes of God, the purpose of God, uh, the, the work of God. So he's, it's a very God-centered book. Isaiah is a prophet of God, for God, about God. So in chapter 1, we begin to see something, first of all, of the wrath of God. Now, you've heard me say this many, many times over the years. My conviction is, particularly in the contemporary American church, that the God that is preached from the average pulpit is too much of a user-friendly God. He is a God that's your good buddy, that is there to affirm every stupid thing you want to do. And that ain't the God of the Bible. Okay? God is rightly known by His wrath, by His opposition to that which is evil. And so we see here in chapter 1, look at verses 3 and 4. And one of the things that, that comes through, maybe it's why the prophets are so dear to my heart, is I would love how to use sarcasm more effectively. Um, I really don't think I use it very much. Welcome back. <laughs> but the sarcasm sometimes just, I love it. An ox knows its owner. What's the implied issue there? You knucklehead, rebellious people, there are animals that know better than you do. So, the ox knows his owner, and the donkey, uh, its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Go on down to verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Now, is he speaking to Sodom and Gomorrah? 
he is using that to symbolize, to communicate in, in really a effective shorthand fashion that as a nation, your wickedness is comparable to those great cities of Sodom and Gomorrah who I saw fit to wipe from the face of the earth. That is a scathing indictment. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. Modern application? Don't play church. Don't play church. It's not a game. So, I've had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, of fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. As Samuel told Saul, better to obey than to sacrifice. It's better to honor God with the obedience of your life than with religious activity that is devoid of meaning. And so, upon this indictment, Isaiah warns of a coming destruction. And we'll see this phrase repeatedly through the prophetic books. But he introduces to us, at, at least in terms of our working through the Bible, the term, the day of the Lord. Now, that appears in the New Testament, okay? So it, it's a repeating thing. It is the day that God exacts His vengeance upon His enemies. And in fact, in many ways, in vengeance upon His enemies, He delivers, through their, delivers His people through His judgment on those enemies. And so there's a day of the Lord, or as it is here in chapters, uh, chapter 2, uh, that day. There is a day coming, but he also uses the very phrase later in the book, the day of the Lord. There's a judgment coming on Jerusalem because there's wicked uh, as uh, Sodom. That, that this special place, this special people that God has saved, he's redeemed, he's set up in this nation that the walls that protect them are going to be broken down. They're going to be given over to their enemy. They're actually going to go into exile. So almost 200 years before Jerusalem falls at the hand of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, Isaiah is saying what? The walls of Jerusalem are going to be leveled and you're going to be taken into exile. In chapter 5, verse 25, Isaiah wrote, Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against, underline, His people. Now, I would want to exercise some caution. And uh, one of the guys that I used to listen to all the time, hadn't had a chance to listen to much lately, is a guy named Steve Brown, Key Life. And he loves to say, Now God's not mad at you anymore. Jeff, you know what I'm talking about. God's not mad at you anymore. And there's some truth to that. And there's a great truth. You're not under condemnation. If you know Jesus Christ, you have peace with God, and you're not under condemnation. But He is our Heavenly Father who knows how to exercise appropriate discipline to get our attention. As Ezekiel wrote, and it's brought forward in the book of uh, Peter, uh, one of Peter's epistles, that judgment begins with the household of God. And so... I've said this many times. I, 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 I want you to get this and understand it appropriately because I'm accused sometimes of being mean and judgmental and all of these type of things. But if there's one thing that I'm against, one thing that I think is wrong, and I think it's so dangerous that there will be millions of people in hell because of this, that the idea that you can be completely divorced from the things of God, from the people of God, from any desire for holy living, any concern about what the Bible says about how you live, and you can be perfectly happy in that state, and yet you're a Christian. I'm going to heaven when I die is a lie from the pit of hell, and it smells like smoke. Because God, if you're his child, will make you miserable in your sin. And probably most of us here have some personal experience of the rod of God's discipline in our life. And so, it just doesn't happen. You just don't go on and on and on. 
So he stretched out his hand against them and struck them, and the mountains quaked, and their corpse, corpse were <laughs> refuse in the middle of the streets. For all of this, his anger has not turned away. His hand is stretched out still. He's bringing judgment on a wicked people. Their offenses, religious nominalism, societal corruption, religious pluralism and syncretism, moral debauchery. Chapter 5, verse 11, Woe to those who rise early to sin in the morning that they may run after strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. Cultural wickedness, uh, the greed of the society, 5-8, woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field, and surely many houses shall be left desolate. God is going to bring judgment on the greed of the nation. Go to chapter 6, one of my favorite passages, and I'm so appreciative of Drew for singing what y'all all know. It's my favorite hymn, Holy, 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 a song taken right from Isaiah chapter Six. We're told that, that this is likely the moment in which Isaiah is called to this prophetic uh, ministry. And it is in the year of the death of this great and uh, long-tenured king, uh, Uzziah. And Isaiah has an encounter with the holy God of Israel. Now, I've said this many times, and this, this, is, this is somewhat my paradigm for, for worship. What do we try to do when we gather at North Clay? I want you to not have an encounter with me. That'll leave you empty. I want you to have an encounter with the holy God of our salvation. And in so many ways, that is, that is not a pleasant thing. It is actually a painful thing. Thing, uh, I was talking to some folks uh, this morning, and, 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 and I would characterize them as some, some of the, the most godly people that I know. And yet, in these last few months, uh, the refining fires of God has been at work in their lives. And no matter how obedient and how godly, God, in his brilliant holiness, can always expose that, that latent evil that is always a part and parcel of the reality of our lives. They're all, he's always exposing them. And so, if you just very quickly, uh, we see uh, there the confrontation with the Holy One. Uh, these uh, seraphim are crying out the great reality of, of the holiness uh, of God. And the, this conviction of this man that already would have thought of himself as a holy man, as a follower of Yahweh, God, but he is convicted as he cries out, I am a man of unclean lips. He is aware that in comparison with the holiness of God, indeed, he is unholy. And so there is this conviction that takes place as a, as a, a result of this confrontation uh, with uh, the holy uh, God. And I, I, many years ago, as people Imagine people complaining about me. There's, there's really nothing to complain about that I can think of. But they, they would often, oh, he just makes me feel bad. He's terrible, blah, 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 blah. Indeed, when you're confronted with the holiness of God, that conviction is painful. It is. It really is. It's painful for me. As I study each week, it's painful sometimes to think of how, just, just in what, what Brad prayed earlier, it, it virtually brought me to my knees. Forgive me for my lack of prayer. Just forgive me for not being constantly in prayer for myself, for the people you called me to lead. And, and so it is painful. But if you look at verses 6 and 7, I never want to leave you in your pain. Now, sometimes I have to because God's doing a process. And sometimes it just takes a while to clean the mess up. But notice the consolation of atonement. Your sins are atoned for. Folks, that's the gospel. That's the work of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. I want to say to you today, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your sins are atoned for. 
And that is indeed good news. It's okay to smile every once in a while, folks. It won't hurt you. I promise. I promise. I promise it won't hurt you. Okay? And then the commission to frustration. You're going to go, but it's going to be tough. Now, sometimes, and I, you know, you hear these churches, and they've got the big bands and the lights and all this stuff going on, and that's all fine and, and wonderful, and everybody tells you about this great worship service and blah, blah, blah. Maybe it is. I don't know. Let me tell you this. Here's how you know if you've worshiped, whether personally, in your private life, your personal time with the Lord, corporate life. Here's the test. Everybody with me? The response is what? Here I am. Send me. That's the testimony of transformation. That you're confronted with your unholiness. You're consoled by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. And you're transformed to the place where your resign is this. Here I am. Send me. I am yours. That's all I can do. I am a living sacrifice from this day forward. And that happens over and over and over. And of course it's not. It is once and for all. And it's always and repetitive. And so, again, the confession of the great hope of our Savior. Well, y'all are running a little behind today. All right, let's talk about the sovereignty of God. Uh, Isaiah speaks often of the coming Messiah. I mentioned that in chapter 7, verse 14, there's this promise made to Ahaz that he will be delivered, that there's actually going to be a virgin that's going to conceive in his day in 700 B.C. And it's going to be a sign that you're going to be delivered. Okay? And it happened. It was done. And then Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says there's a greater sense in which this prophecy is going to be fulfilled. That, that a virgin, while still a virgin, is going to, in a unique, in a supernatural way, a way that's never been done before and will never be done again, is going to conceive a son, and that son is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he speaks of God's sovereign operations in our world, even over nature. In chapter uh, 38, 7, it talks about that uh, God will make the shadow cast by the declining sun on the dial of Ahaz, Ahaz turn back 10, 10 steps. I don't believe that's symbolic language. I believe that's literal. That, that happened just like it says, that God in some way, I don't know if he's moved the earth. I don't know if he moved the sun. I don't know if he changed the properties of light. I don't know. You engineers go figure it out, okay? He just did it. He just did it, okay? So he's sovereign over nature. He is the Lord of history. In chapter, the end of chapter 44, go there real quickly. Now, Chapter 44, verse 26, 28, mentions the name of Cyrus. Cyrus is a Persian king who is actually the one, if you'll remember from uh, Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah and uh, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, he is the king that provided for the return of the exiles from their captivity in Babylon in 539 B.C. Isaiah is writing, what did I say? 200 years before that. And he calls the pagan king by his name. That's God. That's God. Verse four, uh, chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue the nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, the gates that will not, may not be closed, I will go before you. God takes his pagan king and says, you don't know me, but here's the deal. I'm going to use you because I'm God whether you know me or not. And I've got a plan for you to deliver my people. So God's sovereignty over the course of nature and over the course of history. Isaiah has a word to say about the word itself. In chapter 40, verse 6, I want you look at that real quickly. Isaiah 40, verse 6. A voice says, cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and its beauty is like, like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. 
When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah would write in chapter 55, verse 11, that God's word shall not return void. There's one thing that we have staked our lives upon. We've not established this church upon is the conviction what? That God's word is powerful to do that which God has determined to do. And we believe that. And we are committed to that great truth. And so this word is the testimony to the salvation of God. Isaiah speaks in chapter 11 of the righteous branch of David. And his name is Jesus. He speaks in chapter 53 of the suffering servant, and his name is Jesus. And so Isaiah has such a great deal to say about the one who is promised. And he promises that God will be faithful. He will be faithful to deliver his people from the hands of his enemies. He will be faithful to judge those enemies. And he will be faithful to deliver his people through all of it. He will preserve a remnant for the sake of and because of his son, our suffering servant, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The message of Isaiah really can be summed up by the verse in chapter 1, verse 18. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. That God is the great consoler. He is the great atoner of our sin. He will save his people. He will protect his people. He will purge and purify his people. He will destroy their enemies. He preserved his ancient people, Judah, and he will preserve us. I was shaken this week by the political, legal events of this week. Deeply saddened by where we are as a nation and it's something I hate. And as I read through the book of Isaiah this week, Isaiah, what did I say, was a man of courage in difficult times. God is calling us to be men and women of courage in difficult times. And kind of as I was wrapping things up this week, I couldn't help, not a big southern gospel guy, but these words came to me, and you'll recognize them. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. The crazy people in New York can do what crazy people in New York do. They're going to do it. The crazy people in Washington and Montgomery and on and on it goes. They're going to do it. It's disturbing. But because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just simply because I am the Lord and there is no other. Life is worth the living because He lives. Pray with me. Father, we thank You for Your Word, a Word given so long ago, but a Word ever relevant to us. I pray that you'll bless this to our hearts. God, that we would honor you in all things, that you would be glorified in, through, and among us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.